When they notice the sound of young Gregory's cries getting weaker, Alona Stevens and Janet Powell suspected something was wrong at their neighbor's house. It had been three days since the two had seen any sign of Susan Barlett or Suzanne Armstrong on Easy Street, and they decided it was time to check on them. After making her way inside, Alona found her neighbors face down at the front of the house, dead from multiple stab wounds. Young Gregory was dehydrated, malnourished, but alive. Though there have been multiple suspects, DNA evidence, and potential witnesses, the mystery surrounding who killed Susan Bartlett and Suzanne Armstrong in January 1977 continues to endure. Suzanne and Susan truly were the best of friends. They went to high school in rural Victoria together, traveled the world together, and eventually lived together. In October 1976, when Suzanne returned from Greece with an infant son from a relationship that didn't work out, she reunited with Susan, and the two of them moved into a house in Collingwood on Easy Street. They shared a fence with their neighbors, Alona and Janet, and across the laneway from them lived Gladys Coventry. Suzanne and Susan soon made a life for themselves on Easy Street, which they enjoyed in earnest. They bought a puppy that they named Mishka and held a housewarming and New Year's Eve party attended by many of their neighbours and friends. Suzanne could often be seen riding around the streets on her bicycle with her son Gregory in tow. Both of the Sus also had a healthy dating life. Susan was seen a tobacco salesman, while Suzanne had begun dating a sheep shearer named Barry. On January 10th, 1977, Susan's brother Martin and his girlfriend stayed for dinner and Martin helped fix the house's stereo. It was a perfectly average evening, and everyone was happy to see one another. With baby Gregory asleep, Martin and his girlfriend left around 9pm. To date, they are the last people known to have seen Susan and Suzanne alive. Exactly what happened inside 147 Easy Street during the rest of the evening remains unknown, although we do know some of the events that happened between Martin's departure and the shocking discovery by Alona three days later. Late in the evening on Monday, a restless Gladys Coventry took up a seat in her kitchen at 145 and looked out her window towards Suzanne and Susan's house. Gladys claimed to have seen a man in their kitchen, washing his hands and a piece of cloth in the sink. The man left the house through the back gate with a knife in his hand. Over in 139, just four houses away, 21-year-old Peter Sellers and his friend Bob had stayed up late to watch some TV. At about 2.30 a.m., the two heard a house door slam and two car doors slamming, followed by the sounds of a car speeding away from Easy Street. At some point on Tuesday, Susan's tobacco salesman acquaintance decided to visit the Easy Street house. He'd been calling Susan for a few days and wondered if she'd given him the right number. With the help of a friend, he climbed into the house through Susan's bedroom window, leaving a dirty shoe print behind on her bed. He walked through the room, turned right to go down the hall, and checked the phone number in the lounge room before leaving the house. Earlier Tuesday morning, Alona drove her colleague John Graham back to his house as he'd spent the previous night on her couch. Later that day, Janet and Alona noticed Susan and Suzanne's dog wandering up and down the street. When door knocking and shouting over the fence went unanswered, Alona and Janet left a note on Susan and Suzanne's front door to tell them about the dog. The next evening, a worried Barry and his brother Henry decided to visit the Easy Street house after Barry had been trying to call Suzanne for a few days without any answer. The two brothers knocked on the house's front door and saw the note about the dog but heard no activity inside. They made their way into the house through the open back entrance and left a note with Barry's number on a table, asking Suzanne to call him. By Thursday morning, Alona and Janet were getting worried. Gregory had been crying on and off for the past few days and he'd begun to sound weaker. Alona climbed over the fence and ventured inside her neighbor's house. Unlike the other visitors over the past few days, she went all the way down the hall. Though no lights were on, Alona could see Susan lying face down near the front door and Suzanne in the front bedroom. Alona then looked for Gregory and found him in his cot, 
unharmed but very weak. She then told Janet to call the police. From the beginning, the investigation into the murders of the two Sues was not ideal. Initially believing it to be a murder-suicide, police sent a single officer to the scene who quickly realised their assumptions were very wrong. Soon more detectives were on the scene to search the house and they didn't wear any special clothing before the forensic team arrived. In 1977, crime scene forensics was still a relatively new field and such practices for crime scene preservation weren't established. Police found a bloody towel in the lounge room and saw the hallways were streaked with blood, which suggested to the officers that Susan had tried to reach the front door after being stabbed. When detectives examined Suzanne's body, they found semen underneath, leading them to believe that she was the main target of the attack. It was clear from looking at the two women that they'd been attacked with considerable ferocity. Estimates of the number of stab wounds vary, but it was clear that Susan had sustained more than Suzanne. Susan also had stab wounds along her hands, suggesting to detectives that she tried to fight off her assailant. When they examined the bathroom, detectives found more bloodstains on the bath and the sink. Whoever had carried out the attack had taken the time to try and wash themselves after. Police also found bone fragments inside the bathroom drain, which likely belonged to one of the women. A face washer containing semen stains was also discovered in a manhole outside the house. The study of the house, its clues and other inquiries led police to create a list of over 100 suspects, with eight men of particular interest. Gregory's biological father was quickly ruled out as Susan and Suzanne's killer. He was in Greece at the time of the murders and didn't know anyone in Australia who could carry them out on his behalf. Barry Woodard and his brother Henry were near the top of the police's list. The brothers freely admitted to being inside Susan and Suzanne's house and leaving the note behind, but told police that they saw nothing out of the ordinary and didn't hear Gregory's cries. And while it may seem strange that none of them saw anything, the layout of the house makes their version of events at least possible. The brothers also had an alibi for the night of the murders as they were staying at their sister's house. Susan's tobacco salesman acquaintance contacted police as soon as he saw news of the murders and told them about his trip in the house and the footprint he left behind. Like the brothers, the salesman didn't see or hear anything unusual whilst inside the house, even though his route brought him closer to Susan and Suzanne's bodies. The salesman turned right down the hallway while Susan and Suzanne were to the left. Police questioned him extensively but ultimately didn't consider him a viable suspect and released him shortly after. John Grant the man who stayed next door at Alona and Janet's house on the night Susan and Suzanne were killed was also a prime suspect. A crime reporter and colleague of Alona, Grant often mixed with the criminal elements and police of Melbourne as part of his job. He also happened to have a connection to another unsolved crime. Julianne Garcia Sillet was a 19 year old, missing and presumed dead since July 1st, 1975. John Grant, ex boxer Tommy Collins, and violent career criminal John Joseph Power were all at Julianne's apartment on the last night she was seen alive. The suspicions surrounding Grant's involvement with Julianne, combined with being next door on the night of the murders, led to him being one of the first people police interviewed. Though he came under heavy scrutiny, police couldn't make a connection between Grant and the two Sues beyond his visit to their neighbour's house on the night of the murders. Besides the tobacco salesman, Barry and Henry Woodard and John Grant, other police prime suspects included an ex-cop kit of the force over sexual assault allegations, as well as a man from Manila who dated Suzanne several years before and was already known to police. Despite the efforts of investigators, none of their suspects were ever charged, and the inquiry into the murders of Susan and Suzanne, held barely six months after their deaths, failed to bring any significant information to light. The detectives involved in the investigation moved on to other cases, and progress in finding Susan and Suzanne's killer came to a halt. Though police exhausted their suspects and evidence, there were some people who could have told them more about the night of the murders. 
Gladys Coventry in 145 did try to tell homicide detectives about the strange man she saw in Susan and Suzanne's kitchen on the night of the murders. The detectives listened, but Gladys felt they treated her very rudely and she refused to speak with them any further. Once they realised their mistake, police tried to get more information out of Gladys by sending an officer dressed as a doctor to her home under the guise of a welfare check. Gladys saw through the ruse though and didn't talk. Police never made an effort to press her further after this failure. There wasn't even an attempt to get a police sketch done of the man Gladys says she saw. Gladys died in 2006 at 101 years old, having never given a complete official account of what she witnessed the night Susan and Suzanne were murdered. Like Gladys Coventry, Peter Sills tried to tell police about what he heard the night the two Sues were killed. To Peter, the assumption about only one person being involved in the murders was wrong. The multiple car doors slamming meant at least two people were present. Police did visit Peter's house and spoke with his mother, who told them that her son had some information about the night of the murders that could be important. The detectives noted his name and promised to follow up with Peter, but they never did. Though he's made his own efforts, police are yet to take a formal statement from Peter about what he heard. Gladys Coventry and Peter Sellers were not the only ones who felt that police efforts to discuss the murders with them had fallen short. Alona says she never touched Gregory when she was inside the house, and the young child was carried out by a police officer. But Alona's statement to police has her telling them that she carried Gregory out herself. And besides her first statement, the police have never spoken to Alona again about what happened on Easy Street. Successive DNA tests have continued to clear all of the men police have suspected of killing Susan Bartlett and Suzanne Armstrong. In 2017, a $1 million reward was offered for any information leading to an arrest, but no new evidence has emerged to date. Some police that worked the case in its early days have admitted that errors were made that may have been costly, especially when canvassing potential witnesses. Homicide detectives also didn't consult with the local Collingwood police or ask for any insight into locals that may have been persons of interest. There's also the possibility that the semen, the main DNA evidence investigators had been working with, was contaminated or mislabeled before testing could be carried out. It would explain how none of the suspects has been a match for the crime scene DNA and would add yet another element of frustration to a case that's been mishandled. If the DNA hasn't been corrupted, it may still be the best hope of finding Susan and Suzanne's killer through forensic genealogy. With the police's suspects ruled out, DNA testing could expand to those in the area at the time of the murders and their descendants. It has been done before. The 1956 murders of lovers Lloyd Bogle and Patricia Kalitsky in the US were solved in 2021 thanks to forensic genealogy. Semen found on Patricia was eventually linked to a deceased man who wasn't a suspect at the time of the murders, after his children's DNA proved to be a match. And there is plenty of scope for a previously unknown person to have also carried out the Easy Street murders. While Susan and Suzanne lived on Easy Street, construction was underway on the Collingwood Community Health Centre directly behind their house. Perhaps one of the construction workers spied on the women and developed an infatuation with tragic results. There would have been many workers attending the construction site through casual and itinerant labour, which may have made it easier for them to avoid suspicion. All we do know for sure is that someone has got away with murder for over 40 years. We can only hope that they will one day be exposed and bring justice to Susan, Suzanne and their families.